three different, uh, I guess, three different situations or circumstances. And really what I want to do is just read you some scriptures, okay? And I'm reminded also, thinking about this message, I'm reminded of Elijah, Mount Carmel, feeling like he's the only one, you know, running from Jezebel. And what does God tell him? He says, there's, uh, there's 7,000 left behind that have not bowed their knee to Baal. What the media would want us to know, think right now and to believe right now is the majority of white folks, especially, are racist. That's what they'd have us, have us to believe. They would have us to believe that the Republicans are so far out in la-la land that they are out of touch with society. The Republicans would like us to believe that the Democrats are so far-fetched that they're out of touch with society. The truth of the matter is, I think they're all so far-fetched that they're all out of touch with society. And we've gotten so far away from God that people don't really understand, and I'm talking about even in our churches, that people don't even understand what church is really all about. We have been taught in America that churches are a place of prejudice. Because if you have a white church, then the white church wants nothing to do with black people. And if you have a black church, you have want nothing to do with white people. In fact, a true church cares nothing about color. That's right. Race, looks, social background, demographics. A true church, a true Christian does not see in color Amen. other than the color of red which is the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. but the world would have us to think that because we believe in Jesus Christ that we have a white God or a white Savior that we are prejudiced or racist when in fact, the total opposite is the truth. Because we have a Savior who loves all mankind, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. I'm here to tell you once again, and I know this has been the issue for a while, but racism has no part in the church. Racism should have no part in our Christian walk and in our Christian lives. You know what's amazing about this is we are all different, and we all have different... What's, what's amazing is not only if you go to a black home or you go to a white person's home, there are differences in how they handle their affairs, and they are different. But it doesn't matter if they're black or white. If you, I, you walked into my house and you saw everything that we did 24-7, you would say, well, that's kind of a strange way to do it. We sure don't do it that way. Everybody is different. And everybody grows up different. And that's part of the beauty of being a Christian or being an American is because everyone is different. I don't know about you, but I am intrigued by other people and their traditions. Chantel probably gets tired of me and all the questions I ask. I didn't grow up in a black home, but I'm very interested in what it's like. Guess what? And I know it's easy to pick on Chantel, but here's the reality. I'm interested because I didn't grow up that way. But you know what happens when Chris Barron comes? I ask the same questions I ask him as I ask Chantel. Amen. What was it like growing up in the Philippines? When uh, Pedro Torres comes... What's it like in Spain? You know what our biggest question is most of the time? What do you eat there? <laughs> 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 
all of our missionaries, they come from different places and or they go to different places and they they may have come from the, you know, uh, if you think about America, you think about they come from the south, you know, they come from the southern country, hillbilly, whatever you want to call it, background. And they're going somewhere where those people don't even speak English and they have no idea what you're talking about. You, But they have to understand and learn about them. And that's the beauty of learning about one another and learning about different things. I'm intrigued by Chinese, the Chinese people. I'm intrigued by Japanese people. I'm intrigued. And that's the beauty of this world that we live in. God has made us all different. And there's nothing wrong with being curious and interested and, and excited about those things. We all are intrigued by the Indians. You know, we look back, and I know Brad mentioned Westerns, and we look back and say, wow, look at, you know, what was it like to grow up and to be an Indian, uh, to live in a teepee? I'm like, that's pretty cool to find out about, but I don't want to live in a teepee. But there's nothing wrong with living in a teepee if that's where you come from and how you're born. We're all different. But in being different... The truth about the church is that the church should be the most loving institution in the world. Amen. Because it has the author of love as the center of our attraction. And that is God, the Heavenly Father, who does not know the difference. Although, don't take that the wrong way. You understand what I'm saying. But does not preclude between black or white or whatever color. They're all one race. We are all of Adam. Yet the world, and especially American media, would have us to believe that everybody's racist if you are a Christian. And I'm here to say 100%, if you are a Christian and you are a racist, you are living in sin. Amen. If you were to go knock on doors as a supposed Christian and you went to knock on a white house, but you saw a black person's house and you decided to go on by, you are racist. They need Jesus Christ. That's right. yeah. And Jesus died for all mankind. Right. Every color, every race, every creed. Though there's one race, we understand that. And I'm not the foremost expert on all this. But I do know this. If you test my blood, and a black person's blood, and a Japanese person's blood, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. There's different, we understand, there's different types. It's all the same. The amazing thing about that is, if any one of us gets a cut, we all bleed. If we get bumped, we get hit by something, it all, we all hurt. Because we are all one. And we all come from God. And as a Christian, during these times, once again, where I believe we're just being fed lie after lie after lie, what do we do? What do we do? And when we turn out to be the bad guy, or it looks like we are being portrayed as the bad guys, what do we do? And it reminded me of three separate stories in the Bible. And there's a hundred stories we could look at, but we're only going to look at three. And I really want to just read the story to you. And I want to give you just a five things that all these people have in common, all the, the groups that we'll look at here have in common. I want you to see, as we look at Daniel, chapter 3, and you're all there, but I'm up here blabbering away, so <laughs> let me get there. Because to be honest with you, is it not frustrating? Mm -hmm. How many of you parents like it when your kids come to you and lie to you about things? You may believe them right off the bat, but once you find out what the truth is, are you a happy camper? Of course you're not. And I'm not real happy about what we're being told. I'm not be real happy about what we're seeing. But the reality is, this is nothing new under the sun. This has happened before. I was talking to Brother Jim the other day. He and I didn't get, grow up in the civil rights movement. But it's not a whole lot different than what we're facing today. If you look at history. And what do we know about history? It repeats itself. Mm -hmm. And we're going right back through riots. 
race issues. We're going right back through those things. Guess what? History repeats itself and we don't learn. And unfortunately, sometimes our churches haven't learned. But you know what? You can go way past the riots and go all the way back, even before Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But I want you to see what happens to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 3, I want you to look at verse 1. And I know there's a lot of reading here, and we're going to just we're gonna read it. I, I just think we need to hear the Word of God this morning. And maybe kind of try to correlate this to the times that we are in right now. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. By the way, we think well, that's not going to happen today. Don't be too sure. If we as Christians stand still and speak, remain silent, we just may find ourselves bowing down to something we never thought we'd ever bow down to. Not only, and I'm not an expert in these things either, but I can tell you this, not only can we think and be afraid of, of America and what America's trying, what some Americans are trying to do, but you talk about a one world government that could happen real quick. Things can happen a lot quicker than we think. Verse 2 says this, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, and the treasurers, and counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image, which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people of, of nations and languages, doesn't matter what people, what language, what nation you are, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery, furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Sound familiar? They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. I don't know if you remember this because it's been so long. But a few months ago, guess who was being attacked for leaving their doors open? And if you don't shut your doors, we will come visit you. That's right. Who was being accused at that point? Us. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. Didn't you make that decree? And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth that, he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province. Interesting. It's certain Jews. Today, it's many Christians, if not all Christians, right? Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, harp, sack up, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made? Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, 
We are not careful to answer, answer thee in this matter. Now let me just make something really clear right here. I think we all remember and know what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say. But let me make something very clear. I do not believe in any way, shape, or form, and you may be able to prove me wrong on this. I don't believe so, but you might be able to. I don't believe in any way, shape, or form that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were arrogant about this. Brad preached about it this morning. I don't believe they went up and said, ha, we're not going to listen to you. I don't believe they were proud. I don't believe they were arrogant. I don't believe they were disrespectful. You say, why don't you believe that? Well, there's several spots in here where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king of Ezekiel, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. I don't believe they were arrogant about it in any way, shape, or form. However, the facts came out when they spoke. What I'm trying to share with you and encourage you today is I don't believe we need to be belligerent, arrogant, prideful, any of those kind of things, but I do believe we need to stand. And I do believe we need to stand with a humble spirit and a humble heart in the sense that unless we take a stand, how will anybody ever hear? Verse 17 says this, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to, to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Did they know the consequences? Of course. Do we know what could happen if we get the wrong leadership in the White House and in all over this country? Do we know what could happen? Of course. But that, that, does that change our faithfulness? Does that change where we stand? No. They knew the consequences. It's a burning, fiery furnace. And we believe that he's able to deliver us. Our God, God the Father, he will deliver us out of the hand, O King. Out of thine hand, O King. But if not, regardless of God's sovereignty, God's will, whatever God's will is, if God would choose not to deliver us, notice their stance. Be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods. And again, I think maybe their tone was a little bit like that. Hey, King, we just want you to know if our God can deliver us. And, and I, we believe he will. But if he doesn't, we're not trying to be mean or arrogant or rude, but we're just not going to bow down to your gods because we serve God the Father. And that's who we serve. Now, they might not have been that nice. I don't know. But that's my thought process on where they were coming from. Because there's no point in being mean, belligerent, arrogant. But they say, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image with that which thou hast set up. Now keep this story in mind and turn over to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. And I've told you several times in the last few weeks, and I'll be honest with you, it's bothered me. And it's kind of confused me to try to understand what the truth really is. Not to mention that the devil throws other attacks at you. And isn't it interesting, sometimes we're weeks, and sometimes you have weeks and months of that where it just seems like it's constant attack, whether it's from the news media, or whether it's from people, or whether it's from your own family, or whether it's just from a problem that you may have at your house, or a project that you're working on, or those kind of things. We'll not get into projects at this point, because usually when I start a project, it ends up being eight projects instead of one project, because you find out there's more things wrong than what you originally thought. That's what happens. But that's not it. Things just keep coming, and things just keep attacking you and keep after you. And I want you to consider Acts chapter 5, look at verse 12. It says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord. We need to magnify the Lord today so more people are, are added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Boy, where's that kind of Christianity today? Where there is so, we're so filled with the Spirit of God that, it's, that, that the people actually believe if Somebody just walked by and your shadow crossed them that you could be healed. I feel like sometimes today our 
level of Christianity is not where it needs to be. Our level of spirituality, maybe I should say, isn't where it should be. But we find that they're looking to bring people just to get under the shadow of Peter. There came also a multitude out of the city round about unto, unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Now here's what happens, right? Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught, but the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain... The, with the officers, and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. When they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? Sounds familiar. Jesus' name today is now becoming blasphemy. This is what the world is saying. That name is racist. So if you believe in Jesus... Notice, we told you not to speak in this name. When they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them straightly, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. You know what the world doesn't want us to, be, want us to fill it with? Is the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the truth. Would rather believe in lies. Men chose darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. Notice, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You want to blame us for this? You know what's amazing about this whole blame thing? We're not supposed to blame anybody, right? But guess who's getting blamed now? Christians. Republicans. We're blaming everybody. They did it. It's their fault. Now notice in verse 29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, What is what they say? We ought to what? Obey God rather than men. Amen. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given them to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and looked uh, and took counsel to slay them. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What was their response? It was a godly response. We believe in God. We trust God. And our, we believe our God can deliver us. And even if he doesn't, we're still going to believe in God. And we know he's still alive. We know he's still real. And we know that we can trust him. But if he decides not to deliver us, we're still not going to bow down to your gods. Peter tells us we ought to obey God rather than man. You told us not to preach and teach in the name of Jesus Christ. Seems like it was a long time ago they told us to shut down our doors. Part of it might have been because there was an epidemic, supposedly, going on. But you think there might have been a chance that part of it was because that was a legal scheme. If we can shut down churches, we can shut them up. They threw Peter in prison. What happened? God got him out. He's still preaching. They catch him. You're talking in the name we told you not to talk in. Well, guess what? We ought to obey God rather than men. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. 
In just a moment, we'll wrap this up and tell you exactly what these folks had in common. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Peter. We could throw Paul in here. We're not going to do that. Many others. And now we're going to look at Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungry. And when a tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Sounds like demands once again. Accusing. Accusations. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You realize today that all it takes is an accusation to destroy people? All you have to have is an accusation. I remember when I first started in youth work, and when I first started, we didn't have to worry about it quite as much, but early in that, that, that period, with a lot of stuff going on, and when I, you know, we, we ended up starting having meetings at our church, different things like that, and, and hearing from other people, you got to protect yourself. you got to be careful, because if there's an accusation, it can destroy your church. So all it has to be is an accusation. It doesn't have to be true. It doesn't have to be real. Here comes Satan accusing Jesus, basically, and asking him, hey, if you do this, look at verse 5, then the devil taketh him into a, a, the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give the angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, and is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into a, an exceeding high mountain and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, or then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written... Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Three separate stories. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Peter, and now Jesus. Peter and, and those that were with him. And, and Jesus. They all were accused. And as we think about this, I entitled this The Faithful Believer, and I promise these points will be quick because we're not really going to go back and necessarily look at the Bible any, anymore. We're just going to look at these points of how it ties everything together. The first thing that I think we see from every one of these stories, all three of these stories, is all three people were being bullied. Now we hear about bullies all the time, right? But guess what the media has become? Bullies. Who do you think they're trying to push around? Anybody that they can. Now, I'm not a fan of bullies. However, I will tell you this. Sometimes when there are bullies around, and this will probably go viral and I'll, 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 I'll be a, you know, an outcast because of this. Bullies can make you stronger. Because eventually, and by the way, it doesn't matter how much you try to wipe out bullies, there will be bullies. Not only happens in schools, it not only happens in workplaces, it also happens in church. Where some people try to bully other people and kick them out of the church or push them out of the church or cause problems in the church. Those things happen. Now, the question is, is what do we do with bullies? How do we handle bullies? Now, I'm not going to give you what... The answer you may want, some people may say, oh, I think we should just punch him in the nose. Well, the Bible does say a soft answer turns away wrath. So sometimes the way that the best way to handle, many times, if not all the time, the best way to handle a bully is to give him back a soft answer. I'm not saying be weak, but I'm saying give him the truth softly. Now, sometimes there's a point where you can't do that. It gets to the point where you may have to defend yourself. It's kind of like, hey, if somebody tries to break into your house, the first thing you may not, you may not do the first thing is pull out your gun. 
But if you find out they really are threatening your family, then you may pull out your gun. But at first you may say, listen, I have a gun, or listen, you know, whatever. I'm not sure what you're going to announce to them, but you may announce something in trying to deter them, if that makes sense. But guess what those people are trying to do? They're trying to bully you. They're trying to get into your house. They're trying to say, I'm going to take what you got. I want what you have. Guess what they're trying to do in America today? Trying to take what rich people It's a sin to be rich. Well, then why do you, if that's true, then why are you trying to take what they got? Because wouldn't that be sin if you had it then? Wouldn't that be wrong? Wouldn't that be wicked if you had their riches? No, not if I had it, but if they have it, it's bad. So they're all bullied. You either bow down or we're going to throw you in a burning, fiery furnace. You either stop preaching in the name of Jesus or we are going, uh, uh, we're going to throw you back in prison. Jesus, hey, if you do this, you can do it. What do you think Satan was trying to do? He was trying to tell Jesus what to do. That's right. Not only were they all three bullied, but number two, they were all three believers. All three groups were believers. Obviously, Jesus is the Son of God, so that's a little bit different, but you understand what I, where I'm going with that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we believe in God. We're going to serve God. They're all believers. Guess what we have in common today if you are saved here in this room? You are a believer. Those, anyone who may listen or watch this message, guess what we have in common? We are all believers. And guess who gets attacked often? Believers. Who gets bullied? Believers. It's Christians who are causing all this hate crime. It's Christians who... No, it's not. It's you. They're the ones that are causing it. They're making up something that's not always there. And the reality is, believers will be attacked. These believers were attacked. The third thing we see about these, group, these three groups is they were all bold and brave. In the midst of of a difficult situation, they stood their ground. They were bold. They were brave. The fourth thing we see about these three groups was they were all bound. So what do you mean by that? They were all bound. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were bound and thrown in a fiery furnace. Peter, what was that happened to him? He was bound and thrown in prison. Jesus was bound and put on an old rugged cross. Was he not? Of course he was. He was nailed to an old rugged cross for you and I. They have that in common. It's kind of nice, nice having things in common, right? See, they have those things in common. Even though being bound is not a fun thing, they were all bound. The, the fifth thing I want you to see is, and I'm going to give you an extra bonus here in just a minute, but the fifth thing I want you to see about these three groups is they were all blessed. God delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar said, I, did we not throw three men into the, fires, fire, the fire and the furnace? But now there's four. And the fourth man like the Son of God. It's a blessing to have God on our side, folks. Because no matter who wins an election, God's still on our side. We're on the winning side. Amen. We're on the winning team. And we're blessed as a result of that. Peter, he was blessed. He got out of prison. He said, well, yeah, but Peter got martyred. <laughs> yeah. But he's still blessed. If my life ended today from some tragedy, I'm still blessed. I've been blessed, and I'll be even more blessed when I make it to heaven. What a, what a joy that will be. But the fifth thing, the sixth thing I want you to see today is, is, is this. I find this interesting. There's one thing that they all, one other thing they had in common. Now, there's probably a whole lot of other things they had in common, but this book. Amen. They had this Bible in common. What did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He, that's what he responded back to Satan with. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How did Peter respond? By using the Bible and saying, we ought to obey God rather than men. I'm not talking about being arrogant, prideful, mean, hateful. I'm not talking about those things. I'm telling you what we have in common as believers today is this book. The book, the blood, and the blessed hope. This book they had come. What did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say? Let's see. What do you think they used when they said, we're not going to bow down to your gods? Seems like there's a commandment about that, isn't there? Wonder where they heard that from. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. We're not bowing down. We're not bowing down. We got this book in common. They had the fact that they'd been bullied in common. They had the fact that they were all believers in common. They had the fact that there was they were bold and brave in difficult situations. I wonder how we'll respond and react. I wonder how we responded and reacted. They were all bound. You know, you say, well, we're not necessarily bound. Yeah, we are. You know what Paul said? I am debtor to Christ. We are bound to serve him. We are made to serve him. Listen, we should be bound by this book. You know, if we're tempted to go do something, we're tempted to go sin, you know what should bind us? This book. But you know what? There could be a day and age where we could be bound for our faith. But even if we are, think of Miss Leah's song that she sings, I'm still blessed. We're still blessed. And I sure am glad, don't you? Aren't you glad that we have this book in common? I don't know what I'd do without it. It's my comfort. It's my solace. It's my resting place. It's where I go. In the shelter of his arms. In the shelter of his wings. This book is what America needs. This book is what all of our churches need. And I think it's, I'm afraid it's time that we as churches and as believers get back to this book. Amen. Stop fretting and fearing over every little thing and just start believing God. Start serving God. And yes, we'll face bullying. We'll face struggles. We'll face difficulties. But we have that. Those many things and many others in common. I want to encourage you during this time, though it can be a discouraging time, and it can be a confusing time. But I'm glad we have his word in common. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Pray in a special.